Hi, today we're going to talk about angular momentum. We have three goals today. One is we'll simply introduce the concept of angular momentum. We're going to draw on what we learned with linear momentum and we'll have a page that has the same kind of uh, rules that we had for linear momentum are going to apply in a very similar way to angular, angular momentum. Second goal, we'll look at a very familiar case of conservation of angular momentum. Just as conservation of linear momentum was very important, it'll be the same importance here for uh, angular, angular momentum. And goal three, we're going to connect linear momentum to angular momentum. We'll see how they are connected. Okay, so what do we know about angular momentum? What's a good way to summarize it? So we really, it's really four things we know about it, four important points. And uh, this isn't actually one of them, but it's actually an important thing to remember. So we used P to represent the linear momentum of a moving object. Now we have a spinning object and we represent its angular momentum by the letter L. Okay, so we had a set of four things that we wrote down for linear momentum. We're going to write down the equivalent four things for angular momentum. So we have a basic equation which says L equals the rotational inertia, I, times the angular velocity, omega. This is completely analogous to P equals M times V. So L is playing the role of P, I is playing the role of M, omega plays the role of V. Note that that is a vector equation. So angular momentum is a vector, just like angular velocity that is, and the angular momentum vector points in the direction of the angular velocity. We have the same kind of rules for linear momentum pointing in the direction of velocity. Both linear momentum and velocity are vectors. Third thing, if there's no net torque acting on a system, then the angular momentum of that system is conserved. Again, we had a very similar statement for linear momentum. If there is no net force acting on a system, the system's linear momentum is conserved. However, it's not conserved all the time. If you have a net torque acting on the system, then you can produce a change in angular momentum, and that change in angular momentum is equal to the torque multiplied by the time interval during which the, during which the torque is applied. So this is basically the impulse idea applied to angular momentum. So again, we had a very similar statement for linear momentum. There we said a net force produces a change in momentum that is equal to the force multiplied by the time interval during which the force is applied. Okay, so we've basically seen this screen before just for linear momentum, so we've got the same statements applying to angular momentum, same kind of statements. Okay, so let's think about angular momentum conservation. So things are a little bit different for um, angular momentum compared to linear momentum. So uh, usually we, we relate linear momentum conservation to collisions. Although you can also relate it to things like there's a guy and his daughter or a guy and his dog in a boat and they move around and what does the boat do, things like that. You can apply momentum conservation to that. So actually this situation is more analogous to the guy and the dog in the boat kind of question. Just one system and with the boat you're moving the mass around, the velocities all um, balance out to keep the uh, net momentum equal to zero. In this case, we have a system which is a figure skater, and all the skater does is rearrange how her mass is distributed. Okay, so she starts spinning with her arms way out. So she has a particular rotational inertia, about an axis of rotation that pretty much goes straight down through her head, all the way down through the middle of her body, and she has initial angular velocity, omega i. So we've all seen this. When this figure skater moves her arm very close to her body, she spins really fast. 
And how did this happen? Well, this happens as a consequence of angular momentum conservation. So moving her arms in close to her body reduces her rotational inertia. But her angular momentum must be conserved because there's no net torque from anything external to the skater acting on the skater to change it. Okay, so the angular momentum has to be conserved. And so if the rotational inertia changes, the angular velocity changes in the opposite way to keep the momentum the same. The angular momentum, that is. Okay, so here we go. We write down our conservation of angular momentum equation, which is just the fact that the initial angular momentum, Li, is equal to the final angular momentum, Lf. And then this is like Pi equals Pf for linear cases. And then we expand out these terms. Instead of m times v, we have i times omega. So we have the initial ang uh, rotational inertia times the initial angular velocity is equal to the final rotational inertia times the final angular velocity. So in our case of the figure skater, IF is less than II, moving her arms and reducing the rotational inertia. So omega F goes up to compensate. Okay, so there's a great example that we've all seen of angular momentum conservation. Okay, now let's, now let's connect uh, angular momentum and linear momentum. And we're going to review torque a little bit here because angular momentum is connected to linear momentum in exactly the same way that torque is connected to force. So here's our torque equation. This is the magnitude of the torque is given by a distance times a force times the sine of the angle between the line you measure distance along and the line of the force. And the distance here is measured from the axis of rotation to where the force is applied, or really to the line of the force anywhere on the force line. We can have a similar equation for angular momentum. Okay, you can basically convert a linear momentum to an angular momentum, just like you can convert a force to a torque, where you can apply a force and get, a, get it to cause a spin. Okay, so angular momentum is Rp sine theta. So you pick an axis of rotation, you measure out from that axis to the line of the momentum, the linear momentum, and you've got an angular momentum relative to that axis of rotation. So it's Rp sine theta or Rmv sine theta. Okay, so here is just an object, and we're going to pin it so we can move around this axis that's marked in red with a black outline. So that's the axis of rotation. And let's just try pushing on it with this force, F. So if we did that, this would make the object spin counterclockwise around the axis. That was the only force acting on it. So what we do is we can extend the line of the force. We can make that line as long as we want. And we can measure from the axis of rotation to the line of the force anywhere we want. But it's often most convenient to measure it so that the line you're measuring distance along meets the line of the force at a perpendicular, at a 90 degree angle. And then in this case, we just have the torque is counterclockwise, and it has a magnitude of simply r times f in this case, because sine theta is sine of 90, and sine of 90 is 1. Okay, so we have a counterclockwise torque equal to r times f in that case. So we can do a very similar thing for linear momentum. So we pick some axis of rotation. And we have a linear momentum here. Okay? And we'll see how this gets applied in class, but this is just how we calculate the angular momentum that results from this linear momentum. Okay? So, first of all, we can extend the line of that linear momentum, make it as long as we want, and then you can measure from the axis of rotation out to that line along any way you want, but it's often most convenient to measure it along a perpendicular. So in this case, our angular momentum is r times mv. And it is, again, counterclockwise. OK. Now, it turns out that clockwise and counterclockwise are fine, but they're not really the true direction of angular momentums, angular velocities, or torques. So those directions are actually given by what we call the right-hand rule.
Okay, so we often use clockwise and counterclockwise, and we'll keep doing that, and probably 92% of the time, we'll be fine with clockwise and counterclockwise. But every once in a while, you really need to know the actual direction of these vectors. And so you can figure that with your right hand. So if you see something that, say, is a counterclockwise torque, like we just had on the previous screen, you take your right hand, you curl your fingers the way the object is rotating, or the way the angular momentum is directed, or the way the torque is directed. And then you stick your thumb out, and that points in the direction of the actual vector. Okay? So here's a couple of examples. Here's one. We have a disk. And let's say it is spinning counterclockwise. Therefore, its angular velocity is counterclockwise, angular momentum is counterclockwise. How did it get this counterclockwise angular momentum? Well, maybe we applied a counterclockwise torque when it was initially at rest. Okay. However, the true direction is of these of all those vectors is out of the screen. So you take your fingers on your right hand, hold them up to the screen, curl your fingers, so your fingers rotate counterclockwise. And then you stick your thumb out. Your thumb should stick out out of the screen, right at you. On the other hand, if you have an equivalent disc rotating clockwise, then when you hold your fingers up so they rotate clockwise, your thumb will be pointing into the screen. Okay, so once again, we will often be able to get away with simply clockwise and counterclockwise as the directions of all these angular variables, velocities, momentums, torques, things like that. But every once in a while we really will need to work with the true directions, which are in fact perpendicular to the plane of the rotating object. Okay, so that's all for our introduction to angular momentum.